23rd weekly webcast. I have a very special guest with us named uh, Mahmoud Nourani uh, that will explain everything you need to know about inflation, interest rates, and the important macroeconomic topics that can really affect our investments. And what you can do is you can type your questions uh, for Mahmoud uh, as he presents, and he will answer your questions after he presents here. And I'll bring on Mahmoud in a second. Uh, in terms of his background, uh, he's got an unbelievable resume as he's worked at Morgan Stanley, UBS, Bluecrest Capital, and the City Capital Advisors a Global Macro Fund. And now Mahmoud is incredibly experienced uh, when it comes to macro investments with a lot of experience as a derivatives trader, a macro proprietary trader, and a macro hedge fund portfolio manager as well. And in 2014, he co-founded and is the CEO of Quant Insight, which is also called QI, that serves institutional investors with investment signals, spanning all asset classes and strategies, and IQ, uh, which guides its non-institutional clients. Now, if anybody wants to get free access to their Discord server, um, so you can access the macro experts for macro education, you can go to the following website. It's IQ, that's E-Y-E-Q, invest.co. Now, Quant Insight uses sophisticated algorithms, uh, including artificial intelligence and data analysis tools to help their clients invest by revealing how underlying macro data is impacting thousands of assets in the public markets. And Quant Insight's hedge fund and mutual, mutual fund clients have a combined assets under management of more than $4 trillion. And its partners include Omega Point, Symphony, and Equity Data, Sur Equity Data Science. Now, QI also works with the leading academics from the universities of Cambridge, Princeton, and Harvard to keep us at the cutting edge of what is really possible when it comes to data analysis. And so Mahmoud has a, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Economics from the London School of Economics. Uh, Mahmoud will present uh, and then take your questions. And so it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Mahmoud Nourani. Mahmoud, thank you so much for joining us. Chris, what an introduction. Thank you so much for that. So I'd like to talk to you today about this thing that you read a great deal about in the financial press and on social media called macro. And I think the first thing that would be really useful is to really define what we mean by macro. Now, macro is all about the broad economic environment we live in. And that's characterized by things that matter, matter a lot to us in our daily lives, like the unemployment rate, inflation, mortgage costs, credit card borrowing costs, uh, employment and job prospects. But it's also very important for markets. And so it's worth taking a moment to think about how these broad economic forces actually impact individual companies, specific sectors, and the big broad indices that we all know and love like the S&P 500. And the way to really think about where the rubber really meets the road is to just consider for a second that the revenues of a single company are really determined by the price they charge and the amount they sell. And clearly both of those are impacted by whether the economy is running hot and in a boom, or whether the economy is really struggling and growth is very slow. Costs are determined by things like input prices, how much do the commodities and inputs for production uh, cost, the currencies, uh, and whether the dollar is strong or weak also impact all these different aspects. And it's interesting, over the last few years, we've seen more and more CEOs of huge companies come out in their quarterly earnings reports and talk about things like what's going on in China, the fact that the dollar is so strong. And in fact, in Apple's latest um, Q4 earnings announcement, Tim Cook sat there and said, look, slow growth in China was an issue. The strong dollar was an issue. Higher prices for input materials, copper and lithium was an issue. Uh, and so 
it's very clear that these big, broad macro forces actually impact markets. Now, different companies will be impacted in different ways. And there is a whole vocabulary in investing around how macro forces impact different companies. And so you'll find in stocks, there are some companies called cyclicals. And those companies do better when the economy is running hot. And, you know, demand is strong and unemployment is low. GDP growth is strong. And those are companies like, for example, travel and leisure or consumer discretionary, big ticket items and luxury goods. When times are good, people tend to spend more money on those. And there are other companies that are called defensives. And these companies do OK when the economy is going through a really tough time. You know, nobody economizes on nappies and toilet paper when times are tough. <laughs> so you have these cyclicals, you have these defensives. And there are yet more categories. But the broad point here is that all these macro variables, such as economic growth, interest rates, inflation, wage growth, whether the dollar is strong or weak, all have a big impact on the companies we invest in for our savings. And so it's worthwhile to just get a bit more familiar about how these big forces are impacting markets. Now, one of the key ideas in the world of macro is the idea of the business cycle. And I will also talk about what is generally called fine tuning. Now, the business cycle, if you look back over the last 40 years, you'll find there are periods when economic growth is strong and unemployment is low and inflation is a little bit high. And then you'll find other times when, unfortunately, the economy is weak, unemployment is high. And so this is the, the cycle. And cycles last one to three years, typically. Um, and... As an example of the business cycle, let's imagine for a second that the economy is kind of doing OK. It's growing around 3%, which is, you know, around average. Inflation's around 2%, which is the Fed's target, the, the Federal Reserve's target inflation rate. Unemployment is lowish and everything is sort of going OK. And then a shock, an external shock to the global economy comes along. And probably the best example is the COVID crisis that started in 2020. And all of a sudden, businesses have to shut, people have to stay at home, shops and restaurants are, are closed, people start you know, losing their jobs, and everything slows down. Now, one of the features of modern economies, post-war modern economies, is that governments realized that if they just allow loads and loads of companies to go bust when the cycle is weak, that's actually incredibly wasteful because it takes a huge amount of effort to build a business. And so the idea came about after World War II that one of the roles of government is to try and smooth out the business cycle and to save companies when you have these terrible shocks to the external shocks to the economy. And in the long run, this is really worthwhile because it's far more efficient to save companies and step in and help when times are tough than to just let them all go bust and then, you know, rebuild. And so if we take COVID as an example, the government had and continues to have really two big levers they can pull. And the two big levers they can pull when a shock comes along are what, what is called, number one, monetary policy, and number two, fiscal policy. Now, monetary policy refers to the ability of the central bank, and in the case of the United States, that's the Federal Reserve, and in the case of, for example, the Eurozone, that's the European Central Bank. And in the UK, it's the Bank of England. 
The central bank has a huge influence on the cost of borrowing. The cost of credit is, of course, a very important factor in economic stimulus and activity. And what the government can do and what the Fed and what the central bank can do is they can reduce interest rates and have an active monetary policy to make borrowing cheaper. And they can make borrowing cheaper for companies who take out loans. They can make borrowing cheaper for all of us who go out and get a mortgage. They can make borrowing cheaper for credit cards. And of course, once COVID hit, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates and made borrowing very, very cheap. And the way that feeds into the economy is that it encourages people to actually lend to companies rather than keep savings in the bank. So for example, if I had a 10% interest rate, I'd probably be putting more of my savings in the bank. Whereas if the interest rate was zero, I'm probably trying to search for a return somewhere else. And that will drive me towards, for example, buying stocks. So that's one lever that the central bank can use. There's another lever that has a fancy term, but is actually very simple, and that is called quantitative easing. And all this does is reduce the interest rate available on government bonds. And by making government bonds less attractive as an investment, the idea is to encourage people to lend to companies. And this helps companies get cheaper funding and that helps them invest and revive economic activity. So those are the, the big things that this, the central bank can do, reduce borrowing costs and quantitative easing. Then the second big lever is fiscal policy. And governments can borrow money and spend it to revive the economy. For example, they can cut tax rates, they can provide stimulus checks, which we saw during COVID, they can expand spending on infrastructure and create jobs. So you can see that governments have these tools to smooth out the economic cycle. And that entire activity is called fine tuning. Now, one of the other features of modern economies is the inflation target. And this is really important because there's a very strongly held belief that one of the best things that governments can do is create a stable environment for businesses to operate in and thrive. And what they worry about is that if inflation is everywhere, one year it's 2%, next year it's 5%, the year after it's seven, then it's back to three, is you have a great deal of uncertainty for businesses. So for example, there's uncertainty around wage contracts. Employers and employees find it very difficult to enter into long-term contracts in the knowledge that they have, you know, inflation could be anywhere in 12 months from now. Another big, another big uncertainty is on imports, exports, and business costs. A stable inflation rate means a more stable currency. And this means that businesses can plan and have some reasonable visibility on their import costs and the demand for their exports over time. Now, what global central banks have done in major economies is for many years now, they have set an inflation target of 2%. And what we've been seeing over the last few years is that we had the COVID crisis. Governments pulled really hard on those two levers. Monetary policy, pedal to the metal, maxed out, zero interest rates, let's get the economy moving again. Fiscal policy, maxed out, stimulus checks, let's spend, let's get the economy moving again. And that continued throughout second half of 2020 and into 2021. And then something slightly unexpected happened. And that is that inflation increased way more than they expected. And we almost got to double digit inflation rates. Quite incredible and really not seen for the last 20 years at least. And so that left the Fed realizing that they had a big problem. Inflation was seven, eight, nine, 
nine and a half percent, and they were sitting there with an inflation target of two. And what they have now done is hit the brakes very hard. And so the Fed has taken interest rates from zero to close to 5%. Now, one question that we hear a lot is, well, why is the 2% target such a big deal? I mean, why not just let it be three or three and a half or four? It would save a lot of jobs if they just chilled on inflation. And unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. And the reason is that the US government and all major governments borrow a lot of money and they have this thing called the budget deficit. And they have a large mountain of debt. And the interest rate they pay on government bonds determines how much it costs to service that debt. And today, the US government can borrow for 10 years at around 4%. Now, the reason they can do that is because global investors believe that the Federal Reserve is serious and credible when they say they want to get inflation back down to 2%. Of course, nobody wants to lend to the US government at a 4% rate if they think inflation is going to be 8% because that means that in real terms, they're losing 4% per annum. So, it, so the Federal Reserve is ultimately, and major central banks are ultimately a bit stuck. They can't really chill on inflation. They have to absolutely ensure that markets stay convinced that they are serious about getting inflation down. Now, it's worth also briefly introducing the two sources of inflation we've got. One source of inflation comes from what's called the demand side of the economy. When people are out spending and they're spending loads and loads of money and there's just not enough capacity, prices rise. So think of a restaurant, it's got 100 seats. When times are bad, there's 50 people turning up. When times are good, there's 200 people turning up there's only 100 seats, they're going to start increasing prices. That's the demand side of the economy. Then there's the supply side of the economy. And that's really about having enough productive resources available, like a workforce that can respond to increasing demand. And one of the big challenges we face at the moment in the US and the Eurozone is that the labor force is kind of shrinking. And one of the reasons for that is demographics. So it's kind of amazing, but there are 100,000 baby boomers retiring every week. They are just leaving the workforce. If you look at US immigration trends, we had a big drop after 2016, and we're not really back to those levels of immigration. So that, again, is reducing the size of the available labor force. And that is leading to faster wage growth. Now, that might seem great. Hey, we're all getting stronger wage growth. But the problem is that businesses are passing those costs on to their customers and saying, well, if I've got to pay 5% or 6% higher salaries this year, I'm going to increase my prices by five or 6%. So nobody in the end is better off because we might be earning 5% more, but we're paying 5% more prices and inflation's going up. So we're not really better off. And so that is called structural inflation. And there are some other things going on there as well. One of them is that I guess from around 2005 to probably 2015, there was this huge, there was this huge trend of offshoring. So to give you an example, in London, a software developer <laughs> costs a certain amount to hire. Well, we could call a company in India and they would allocate a software developer for us at about half that cost. So we sat there and thought, well, maybe we should have a couple of people in India. 
One of the big trends we've seen in the last few years is a reduction of this offshoring and going back to onshoring. And part of this is this tr big trend. There's a big buzzword out there. It's called anti-globalization. Uh, and, you know, one of the big areas of offshoring was China. And because of geopolitical tensions and relations are a bit strained between Europe, the Eurozone uh, and China, what you're seeing is a lot of companies say, you know what, I'm not going to outsource my labor to other cheaper labor countries. I'm actually going to onshore. And that is increasing costs for those companies. Um, and so... And so if you put all these trends together, what you're seeing is that part of the increase of inflation we're seeing in the US is actually structural. So it's not that easy for the Fed to deal with. And what the Fed's thinking now is that we're going to have to hit the brakes even harder than we otherwise would have, given that some of this inflation is just that much harder to squeeze out of the system. So let's go to the so what question. Okay, this is all great. Macroeconomics, inflation, the cycle, central banks, monetary policy, fiscal policy. What does this really mean for asset prices? And how is this really going to help me invest better? One of the important tools out there is something called the investment clock. And the investment clock sort of splits the economic scenario into four parts of the cycle. And you've got the boom, you've got the slowdown, you've got the recession, and you've got the recovery. And in those different four environments, different sectors and different companies do better. So for example, in the slowdown, we know that defensive sectors very high quality assets do better. So, you know, Coca-Cola and uh, Unilever and people who sell consumer staples and utilities like electricity companies and water companies, you're playing defense. You know, inflation is going down, growth is going down, you're playing defense. You're happy to take a smaller return, but you want safety and you want to preserve your capital. So in the slowdown phase, particular sectors and companies do better. Then what happens in the recession phase is that interest rates start to go down and bonds and interest rate, what's called interest rate sensitive sectors do better. And so putting your money in treasuries, corporate bonds tend to do better in that recession scenario. Another interesting sector that tends to do better is what is often called growth stocks, stocks that do well when interest rates are going down. And tech is sort of part of that growth stock sector. As we move into recovery, small businesses tend to do better. And so you have small, so-called small caps that do a bit better and you have early cycle sectors, cyclicals uh, that are sensitive to more demand, they do a bit better. And then as you get into the boom, you have what are called late cycle sectors and inflation linked bonds like tips and large caps. So there are some broad sectors that you can fit into the different parts of the cycle. And as you become more aware of the macro trends and the environment we are in, it can be quite an advantage to start thinking about your investments according to these four different categories and say to yourself, hey, well, sort of going into this recession period now, I should be looking at these sectors. Uh, or, you know, we're coming into recovery, I should be looking at those other sectors. So that hopefully gives you a really good sense if we recap what exactly is macro. And we have defined uh, the and we have defined these broad economic forces. 
we have spoken about why growth and inflation and interest rates matter for companies. We have spoken about the idea of the business cycle and the fact that governments are there to try and smooth out this business cycle. So they hit the accelerator when things are looking really bad, and then they hit the brakes when things are looking really hot. And we've spoken about the tools they use, which are monetary policy, and that has two parts. One part is interest rates, and the other part is quantitative easing. And governments can use fiscal policy. So those are the two tools that they have. Uh, and the other really important thing we've covered is this idea of the inflation target and why is it that central banks even have this 2% inflation target. They genuinely believe that in the long term, this is the best way to create long-term prosperity and that is have a stable inflation environment. And we've then just spoken a bit about where the rubber meets the investing road and the different growth and inflation scenarios, recovery and boom and recession, and which sectors of the equity market tend to do better in those particular scenarios. Mahmoud, thank you so much. So I've got a couple of questions for you, and then I'll read the questions for you that my students typed here uh, in YouTube chat. So please keep typing your questions, everybody, and, and thank you. My first question uh, is this. Um, so I, I love to teach with props, as, as you know. So, so the government has two sets of medicine to fix the economy, fiscal policy and monetary policy. What happens when they run out of both sets of medicine, so to speak, meaning uh, during COVID, they couldn't really cut rates anymore because kids, rates were zero uh, and they couldn't really take on too much more debt in terms of a uh, fiscal policy? Good question. What they... What they typically, the, good question. Typically, the governments themselves would say that they have yet more tools in their locker. And probably the, the sort of big nuclear button they can press mm -hmm. is essentially what's called debt monetization. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially to write off the very large amount of government debt they have accumulated and then hit the fiscal button again. So what, one of the things that people get very confused about is this, this idea that governments as uh, central banks have been printing money over the, you know, since 2009 and, and the great financial crisis that they have literally created pure money from thin air. And this has a name that you can Google and it's generally called helicopter money. And the idea is that when time's really bad, helicopter gets flown up there and it just drops $100 bills, loads and loads of them, and it gets the economy going. That's not what the Fed has done. What they have done with things like quantitative easing is they have swapped government bonds for cash. So they have taken an asset out of the system and put cash into the system. What they haven't done is just gone and put cash into the system. So governments would argue that the one tool they have left is is that extreme policy measure hmm. the problem with it is it would massively weaken the currency so the us dollar would just i don't know how much it would depreciate 20 percent, 30 percent, 50 percent. who knows nobody's really done that yet uh, an interesting example of what happens when policymakers start to run out of tools is japan and what Japan did was they said, you know what, we're just going to keep rates at zero forever. And we're also going to buy so many Japanese government bonds that even kind of 10 year and 20 year bonds were close to zero. And they just flattened all interest rates, even out to 10 years. And the idea there was that they're just forcing people to do something else with their money rather than buy government bonds and save. So they can get quite, they, they, there's more things they can do, but there's one thing to, to bear in mind here. There was a, one of the great gurus of macroeconomics was a British Victorian economist called John Maynard Keynes. And they talk a lot about Keynesianism 
and he's sort of one of the guys who really introduced this idea of fiscal policy and fine tuning. And Kane said something very interesting that most market participants really didn't understand after the financial crisis because their governments were dropping interest rates and dropping interest rates and the economy just wasn't really moving. And what Kane said is that the level of risk aversion or how worried everyone is has a massive impact on how effective government policy can be. And to give you an example, in and Keynes called this the liquidity trap. Now, what this really means is that if everyone's worried about the banking system, if everyone's worried about losing their job tomorrow, and if a helicopter came overhead and dropped lots of $100 bills, if they were that worried, they would actually stuff all those bills under their mattress. So one of the big determinants of the effectiveness of government policy is really a human thing, and that is so-called animal spirits. How confident is everyone? And we did go through this period, 2010, 11, 12, 13, where confidence was low. And one of the reasons Japan tried everything and they just couldn't get inflation up and they just couldn't get things moving again was because everyone was worried about the banking system, their savings and life insurance policies that they weren't confident about. And so this risk aversion um, or how worried everyone is really impacts how effective government policy can be. It's fascinating. And I think there's structural issues with Japan, too. Uh, I was reading that, you know, the population is now around 130 million, but it could go to 80 million by the year uh, 2050. Um, so it's uh, it's it's tragic. Yeah. It is. And, and I actually read a few years back that in Japan, they now sell more nappies to old people for incontinence than they do for babies. Wow. So that gives you a sense for wow. the huge demographic shift yeah. going on over there. Yeah. Now, I, I remember back in 2008 when we couldn't jumpstart the economy, we were within 24 hours the world was a bank machine's not working. And so what happened was the government uh, made it against the law in September 2008 to short 800 stocks. Um, do you think the government would do anything like that if the equity markets would be in free fall? I think if the equity market is in free fall, then the answer is probably yes. And I think the reason for that is 99.9% .9 of the time, markets are efficient and work well and everything is fine. But there is that 0.01 or 0.001% of the time when they just stop functioning. And regulators and governments take it upon themselves to ensure that they can step in when markets fail. And when markets become incredibly illiquid, irrational things happen. And I remember in 2009, talking to, to somebody on the trading desk, and we were talking about an example that, well, let's say on our street, there are all these houses, and they're all worth a certain amount of money. And there's one person trying to sell their house, and they just can't find a bid. And they sell their house at 80% below where it was a month ago. The way markets work is all houses would be marked down on that street by 80%. But does it actually make any sense that the marginal seller can actually destroy the entire market? And the truth is it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And there is this thing called the efficient markets hypothesis that markets are totally efficient at all times and it doesn't actually work and history shows us that's just not the case. And so when you have these market failure events, I think you can always expect governments to step in. And actually we had this in the gilt market last year in November. And you basically had a situation where there was no bid for UK government bonds. And the central bank, the Bank of England stepped in because you had this market failure event going on. Wow. Wow. Uh, let's let's pivot now and talk quickly about Silicon Valley Bank. Um, can you explain to us exactly what happened? Um, it sounded logical that, you know, they were collecting a lot of money from, you know, venture capital firms. 
on capital startups. And all these startups, you know, put their money in SVB. And then SVB, you know, did the prudent thing, which is, you know, buy low risk government bonds. What happened to that trade and why why did it fall apart so quickly? So simply speaking, what Silicon Valley Bank did was to take deposits. And we know that if you or I put a deposit in the bank and if we want our money back tomorrow, we can get it back tomorrow. And what they then did was invested those deposits. And if you think of the deposit, it's a one day maturity. So they've taken money for 24 hours for sure. And they then invested it in 10 and 30 year bonds. Hmm. What's happened as interest rates rose is the value of those 10 and 30 year bonds started to drop. Right. And so they borrowed, as they call it, they borrowed short and they lent long. Hmm. Now, one of the interesting features of the modern world is that we can now get on our smartphones and transfer money en masse at the click of a button. And when you had bank runs in 70s, 80s, the way that would work is people would physically line up outside the bank and the teller would count the money out slowly. Uh, and you banks were open a few hours a day. And there was a bit of a limit on how much money could physically be withdrawn because it was a physical process. What happened with Silicon Valley Bank is as rumors spread about issues there, people got on their phones and $45 billion exited in one day. And that sort of tells you that this you know, all sorts of great things at convenience of modern banking, but it means that if people get worried, the money can all just vanish in a nanosecond. And so they found that they couldn't sell their long dated assets at a sufficiently high price to pay back all the money that was leaving. Hmm. And so what the Fed has said is that, well, we know these are safe assets and they will pay you back at par in the end. So you know what, if you give us these assets as collateral, we'll just give you the hundred. We'll just give you the the face value. And that provision means they've tried to short circuit anyone getting worried about the same thing happening again. It's fascinating. I remember back in 2008, uh, when people used to line up at the banks and we didn't use our phones as much for for getting money out. uh, There were hedge funds that hired actors to line up crooked hedge funds to line up at, at <coughs> smaller banks in New York City in order to make it look like there's there's a run on the on the banks. Do you think there's going to be any sort of government regulation to slow down uh, withdrawals? That's tricky. Firstly, I hadn't heard that actually. <laughs> that's like yeah. a very devious yeah. scheme. Um, that's very tricky <coughs> because the immediate response from people might be to say, well, you know what, if the government's going to introduce any, if there's any risk that my ability to withdraw my money instantly when I want it might be contailed, you know what, I'm just going to take it out and put it in the big, one of the big massive banks. Right. So I think governments have to be very careful if they want to preserve the integrity of the regional banking system uh, to, 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 to make sure that the service that the, the retail banking customer gets in a regional bank and a big bank is exactly the same. Mm. Having said that, we do see that money is shifting out of regional banks to the bigger banks. And we do see that money is shifting out of the regional banks and into treasury bills and shorter dated US treasuries. Now, of course, $250,000 her account is guaranteed by the deposit insurance scheme, but balance is above 250,000. And in the UK, it's 85,000 pounds, so about $100,000. Balances above that are potentially at risk. They're not not guaranteed, they're not insured. Um, And so I think governments have to be very careful if they even contemplate having different rules for the regional banks, because people will just take their money and walk. 
Okay. So if, if, if I'm a startup and I just raised $10 million and I'm worried about FDIC insurance, is there any sort of financial product that I can buy that would take the $10 million and divide it into 40 or so different, different banks? Well, most big institutions park their money in US T bills. And hmm. uh, you can get US T bills that mature in weeks, a month, three months, six months. Uh, there, are, there are even overnight instruments. Hmm. And those are the safest. Now, they pay you a little bit less than you would get in a bank deposit. But that gives you the lowest risk that is available. And that is the full faith and credit of the US government. Okay, makes sense. That's great. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we'll go to students here. Yeah. Questions. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, so are we currently in a recession in the United States? Technically, no. So if you look at estimates of real GDP growth in Q1, hmm. January, February, March this year, right now we are tracking about a half percent positive real GDP growth annualized. So about 0.12% growth for this quarter so we're not quite there yet now we'll get the official number in april for first quarter but right now based on all available evidence we're not there yet but we we are slowing reasonably quickly we were tracking around one and a half percent for q1 about a month ago and now we're tracking a half so it is moving that way interesting now what is the lag between when governments raise rates and when it actually hits the economy so it can be anywhere from six to 18 months. Mm. And it also depends on what else is going on in the global economy. And one of the factors that has delayed the impact of rate hikes on the US economy has been the big reopening of the Chinese economy since October, November last year. Mm. And so as China reopened, that has boosted global demand. And the ripples of growth from China have probably helped Europe the most in the first instance. Europe exports a hell of a lot to China. But as Europe has done better, that has rippled globally and generally supported global economic activity. As China's stimulus starts to level out, and there are signs that it is now leveling out, that boost has gone. And, you know, if the global economy has four engines, that engine was doing the work of the other slowing engines, and that engine is now slowing. And so you're seeing all major economies start to slow now. Awesome. Okay, great. My final question for you before I take questions from the audience here is, what is the one macroeconomic data point that you're looking for to make you feel comfortable about the outlook for the global economy? Core US inflation. Okay, okay. That is the single thing that everything else is pivoting around. Hmm. Okay, and is there a certain number that you'd like to see out of the United States inflation wise before you, and which would make you wanna buy growth stocks? Yeah, I think you need to see it get below three and a half. Okay. Okay. And Kurt, we are, yeah, where are we at now? Five and a half. Five and a half. Okay. It's coming down. Okay. Now, well, yeah. month on month, core inflation has been ticking up a bit since October last year. Wow. Wow. It's going the wrong way. Do you think it's going to be this year where inflation goes below 3% in the United States, or is that probably next year? I'd say it's towards the possibly Q4 this year. Okay. Great. Excellent. Perfect. Well, Mahmoud, thank you so much. Uh, so reminder for everybody, if you want to join uh, 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 the free Discord community uh, from Mahmoud's company, you can go to this web address, eyeqinvest.co. So let's take uh, questions now uh, from the audience. All right. Our first question is from uh, Ginny from Vietnam, who wrote, uh, hello, everyone. Hope all is well. Uh, question is, what is the most misunderstood aspect of economics? Great question. I think that this is a, a clear one, and that is the role of money, monetary policy, how money is created, 
um, within the modern economy. And you hear so much confusion, you pick up so much confusion. What is quantitative easing? Is it money printing? And there's, it's a complicated area because you sort of have to understand how a central bank's balance sheet works. Uh, and you really have to get a grip on how money is created in the modern economy. And probably the biggest misunderstanding is that quantitative easing, which many people call money printing, they think it's literally just a printing press uh, and the helicopter flies over and just drops money on the economy. It's it's more involved than that. There's assets, there's liabilities. And I'd encourage everyone to have a read about how the modern monetary system is created. And actually, ChatGPT has a good answer. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> actually, hopefully, ChatGPT doesn't put me out of work. Okay. <laughs> Same. All right. Next, next question here is from Ginny again from Vietnam, which is, how does war affect the economy? So it's interesting because it's, it's a double-edged sword. War does result typically, if, particularly if we look at World War II, for example, in, in a huge increase in economic activity, just the armament building. Um, and you see some sort of elements of stimulus. Countries get into huge amounts of debt. Ultimately, it is an enormous deadweight loss that converts to debt for the economy. And that ends up being paid by subsequent generations. Yeah. So it's it doesn't really have an upside in pretty much any way. Right. Interesting. Okay. And then next up, a uh, question about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, why is it that uh, the United States government is not using cryptocurrencies now? And do you think that a lot of governments will adopt uh, cryptos? Uh, I don't think they will anytime soon. And one of the, you know, crypto is an asset. It's clearly an asset. You can go and buy it, you can hold it, it has a price, it goes up, it goes down, and like many assets, it has certain properties. Mm. One of those properties is that people have confidence, for example, when you look at Bitcoin, that there is a way that it is produced that limits the amount of it that's available. Great, uh, things that are scarce can be worth more. On the other hand, it doesn't actually pay you any interest. So in that sense, it's a bit like gold. And so if we're sitting here in a 5% interest rate world and you're holding your money in regular dollars in the bank account, you're getting five, they're growing by 5% per annum. You're buying Bitcoin, you're not getting interest on it. Fast forward five years, you know, you've got 30% compounded more US dollars, you've got the same amount of, of Bitcoin. Clearly, um, perceptions matter here uh, and many feel that it is something they should have. It diversifies them. It's certainly different. And there are assets like rare wine, art. There's all sorts of assets out there right now. Bitcoin is one of them. One of the reasons it hasn't been adopted is because one of the tools, as I mentioned, that governments need to kind of come to the rescue of the economy when things go really sour is to cut interest rates and stimulate the economy. And when the economy is spiraling into hyperinflation, they need to hit the brakes. And so monetary policy allows them to do that. It's not clear how they would do that if we were spending Bitcoin rather than US dollars. Makes sense. Great. Thank you. Next question is from Abel, who wrote, uh, do you think it's a good idea for the government to shut down SVB instead of providing liquidity? So what happened with SVB was that, number one, their their risk management in wasn't particularly particularly robust or well thought out and they were taking a deposit which is basically money i can rely on for a day if i'm a bank i receive a deposit somebody could take it out tomorrow and they were taking those deposits and investing them in very long term instruments for example a 30 year mortgage so what what then happened is that and this is where technology plays a part in the sort of modern monetary system, is rumors started going around about SVB, the quality of its balance sheet, its asset liability mismatches, and I, I think some VCs advise their clients to take the money out. And as soon as you get a hint of that sort of issue, um, people can withdraw money immediately uh, yeah. on their phones and on, their, on the internet. And so $45 billion suddenly left in one single day. 
which is an enormous amount. And sort of 50 years ago, that was impossible. People would be queuing outside the bank and the teller would be counting the dollars slowly. And you certainly couldn't take that much out that quickly. And so what subsequently happened was SVB's assets and the current market price of them, even though they're quality assets, were was not enough to pay all the depositors as the run progressed. Now, about six years ago, the US changed the regulations and banks with less than 250 billion of assets were essentially allowed softer regulations. The bigger banks have much stricter regulations on matching their assets and their liabilities. Liabilities are the deposits, assets are the bonds they own. So one thing that's absolutely clear, and by the way, since 2009, over 500 US banks have gone bust. In 2014, there were about 14 banks that went bust. The, the question for the Fed is, is this going to undermine confidence more broadly? And the answer they arrived at was yes. And so that meant they needed to protect depositors. Depositors are sort of the innocent party in all of this. They just go to their bank and put their money in and have trust that the bank is fine and the regulators got it all covered. And so the US government decided that in this case, depositors absolutely had to be protected. Regardless, 250,000 is always protected anyway. Uh, and so it was the right thing for the US government to protect depositors. It was also the right thing for the US government to say to shareholders, well, you guys who own this bank, it wasn't well run. You've lost your money. Your your equity stake's worthless. So I think they did the right thing. Cool. Now, is there any relationship between what happened with Credit Suisse and what happened with SBB? Do you think this is systemic? Do you think this spreads to other banks? And should we take our money out of smaller banks? Yeah. So the what started off as a regional kind of US banking issue kind of started to spread. And one of the things we saw in the great financial crisis, one of the issues with the banking system is that when one bank gets into trouble, nobody's really sure whether there are linkages to other banks. You know, are there other banks that SVB or whoever it might be that's in trouble uh, borrowed from that can't pay back? Is this going to be a domino effect? And what in global investors tend to do is that old saying, if in doubt, just get out and take your money out. Yeah. And reportedly, there was a deposit flight from Credit Suisse. But the full story isn't really known because the deal that was agreed over the weekend was really a rapid shotgun marriage between UBS or acquisition between UBS and, and Credit Suisse. And it left a lot of the professionals wondering whether there's something on Credit Suisse's balance sheet that we don't really know about because it smacked of total panic. So mm -hmm. it, it's a slightly odd one. Undoubtedly, the, the 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 sort of jitters that came from SVB played a part. The other thing about Credit Suisse is that the fines they've had over the last 10 years, I think from various regulators, something like $12 billion. Was there something else that the regulator saw? It's not totally clear. Okay, makes sense. Now, why would I as a business owner bother doing business with any regional bank you know, it seems to me that, you know, companies like Citi or Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan are too big to fail and they'll ultimately be rescued by the government. Why would I put money into regional banks? Well, I think the the key thing here is have depositors lost money mm. in any of the regional bank failures mm. you know, in the last 15 years. And the answer is no. OK, so so the, the one thing is that under U.S. law, your deposits up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars are guaranteed. In the UK, it's 85,000 pounds, about $100,000. And that means that up to that amount, you basically got the full faith and trust of the US government behind it. Over and above that, it's your call, really. Um, you know, one has to be somewhat careful. One of the clues, and this really is a great lesson, is that if you're looking at a bank and their deposit rate is much higher than the big banks, you have to ask yourself why. Is there, you're getting more reward, but there's probably some risk behind that. Right. You don't get more reward in this industry unless somebody somewhere is taking some more risk with that money. And so you have to be a little bit careful above that $250,000 limit. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Next up uh, question is the Fed is already uh, uh, raising interest rates yesterday, 25 basis points. Yep. Uh, what is the next step, I guess, for the Fed to control inflation? 
Yes. So the Fed's statement yesterday was a little bit softer on where rates are going to go. So in the previous statement, they referred to ongoing increases in interest rates, ongoing increases. They dropped that word ongoing and they now referred to increasing interest rates as appropriate. Hmm. Now, that tells us that we're pretty close to the end of the interest. Maybe they'll do another 25, hmm. you know, in a meeting or two. The way they control inflation is they leave brakes here for longer. The Fed is sitting there thinking, we're already applying the brakes. Hmm. And we can see this vehicle is starting to slow down now. Um, rather than keep applying more on the brakes, let's just keep this pressure, steady pressure on the brakes and try and bring this to a sensible halt and slow down. And so I think the way they're going to play this now is really about how long they keep rates here at five or five and a half percent. Okay. Why did the market go down yesterday after Janet Yellen's uh, comments? Yes. So Janet Yellen basically push back on the idea that, you know, all bank deposits are guaranteed forever. And, you know, we can we can tell you right now for sure all banks are safe. Well, there's nothing surprising there. We know that deposits up to $250,000 are guaranteed by the US government. And anything over and above that uh, is, is a different story. And one of the things regulators need to be slightly concerned about is what they call moral hazard. And that is they don't want to give a blank check to banks because that would encourage banks to then go and potentially be greedy and irresponsible, thinking, well, you know, the Fed just said that whatever I do, everything will be fine. And so I think she was just giving a bit of a reality check, but it was a reminder to the market that while rates are sitting here at five to five and a quarter percent, things are now starting to break. Um, and we saw that, you know, one of the things behind the deposit flight is the fact that short-term U.S. Treasuries give you such high yields, so you see money leaking from the banking system, deposits going into U.S. Treasuries. Uh, and so one of the interesting questions here is, how is it possible for a slightly dovish Fed statement accompanied with an equity market seller? Hmm. Now, that can happen if the Fed, if basically you're looking at a recession and a credit crunch. And that, unfortunately, is very much the outlook for the U.S. economy in the next quarter. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Follow-up question here, which is yesterday the Fed increased the rate, uh, but the yield curve went down. Why is that, especially the two-year uh, yield curve uh, rate? So uh, the yield curve actually, yeah, uh, yields actually went down. So this, I saw another question in, in the comments about an inverted yield curve, and this is sort of the Fed's overnight rate going up, mm -hmm. but the two-year rate going down and what that is essentially telling you is that the market doesn't think the rate can stay here for very long and that we're going to see rate cuts fairly soon so within six months and in fact the market is pricing quite significant rate cuts in four to five starting in four to five months from now so the, that dynamic is telling you that the market is worried a lot of things will break and inflation yeah. will go down pretty quick right right okay cool all right, next up, Yelaine is asking, with this increased rate environment, half of the analysts recommend to buy short-term treasuries or bonds, and the other half, uh, the long-term ones, as a hedge to portfolios. Where do you stand on this? Um, so where I stand on this is I prefer the shorter term. Mm -hmm. You get a much higher return. Um, so, you know, two years at around five and 10 years at three and 3.8, um, You, the way you should think about this is how much am, am I being compensated uh, by locking my money in for 10 years and losing the flexibility for a, around 4% return versus the ability to get four and a half or five for a couple of years that I can then roll over. And the bet here is that rates will stay higher for longer. So if you think rates will stay higher for longer, go short. If you're of the view that inflation will totally completely collapse in three to four to five months and the Fed will slash interest rates dramatically, then you go longer. Okay, thank you. Cool. All right, next up, Anurag is, is asking, uh, what will be the three biggest economies 25 years from now and in what order? 
Yeah, good question. Uh, so clearly, China that continues to grow somewhere between two and five percent is projected to be the biggest economy in the world. I think there are some fairly populous. Well, the the second one is is India, which continues to grow quite strongly. Uh, and then, so I would say China and India clearly are going to become the two largest economies in the world, just population wow. size and average income growing.、Uh, and then you're really left with probably the U.S. in third place, eurozone in fourth place,、um, and yeah, I, I think India and India and China. And if you look at the last decade, they've been catching up real fast. Yeah. So you think India will pass the United States in terms of GDP? I think that is extremely likely, and, and、wow. you know, not sure of the time horizon, but just given the sheer population and the growth in GDP per capita, that points to ultimately an enormous economy, and India is probably quite underinvested, actually. Interesting. What would you say are the best long-term investment opportunities in India right now? Well, diversification is so important.、Um, And so, really, the the big indices like the Nifty Fifty、uh, are really the things to look at and and have potentially a small allocation to to give you exposure. And there may well be some India ETFs.、Mm-hmm. Really, you want to choose choose something where your dollars are spread out across as many companies as possible. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, cool. Now, what are your thoughts on、uh, Saudi Arabia implying that they might price oil in one instead of U.S. dollars? Yes, I mean the U.S. has an enormous advantage in that it's the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve, so-called world's reserve currency, and and that means that a lot of trade goes on in dollar terms. So I could be sitting in、uh, Nigeria or any other country, Brazil, and if I want to buy crude oil, I need dollars in my bank account. Uh, if I want to buy copper or iron ore or all sorts of things globally, if I want to invest in most hedge funds or asset management firms, I need dollars.、Mm. And so, what you find is that everyone across the world, all businesses, have an account with some dollars in it.、Um, this is what they need to trade, and that increases the demand for dollars, and it makes dollars very strong. It's also a huge advantage that the U.S. has the world's biggest, most liquid bond market because it means people sitting with these dollars can actually park them in a U.S. Treasury bond that gives them some return, you know, over over some period of time. And so it's a really efficient system. There's a lot of geopolitics going on, you know, various alignments and some great game being played that countries play.、Um, what this Kind of Saudi statement means is that it, it's a sort of warning shot that look your dollar reserve status sort of don't take it for granted.、Mm. If we start trading in other currencies, then we the, the global demand for dollars will fall、mm. and the dollar will weaken. People will be buying less treasuries. It'll be harder to finance your deficit, and、mm. of course those benefits would accrue to China if. The yuan became the world's reserve currency. China would find it incredibly easy to borrow. Everyone would want the, to park their money there. Everyone、mm. would have yuan in their balances. There's been a lot of this talk over the last ten years, and the dollar overall has just gotten stronger.、Mm. It may happen, but it's a it's a longer term thing. I I it's very unlikely that this happens in a period of even a year or two years. What would you, thank you for that. What would you say the probability is、uh, that the U.S. dollar is not The world's reserve currency in twenty-five years.、Um, I would say maybe twenty-five to thirty percent. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Given that's a long time horizon,、yeah. I have to give it some decent probability. Right. Okay. Excellent. All right. Next up,、uh, the Berlin from、uh, San Bernardino, California, wrote here, Mahmoud. Good morning.、Uh, can you please explain to me why the Fed raises rates、uh, and real estate prices come down? But there's no inventory. Doesn't that keep prices elevated?、Uh, and what are your general thoughts on real estate? Yeah. So clearly, rising rates、um, impacts affordability, mortgage rates,、uh, and certainly is a negative force on real estate. The way to think about the price of real estate is there's a stock of houses in the U.S. Right? There's this massive stock of houses and apartments in the U.S. 
And the way the price of the whole stock works is it's driven by the marginal buyer or the marginal seller. So to take a simple example, on my street, there's a whole bunch of houses. They're half a million pounds each. And we're all sitting there and we've got our asset. Now, if the house at the end of the street trades for 450,000 pounds, guess what happens? Everything gets marked down. As a real estate agent will say, hey, these houses are all pretty similar. Two up, two down. 450,000 was the last price. And if the next price and the next marginal seller, then let's say that person at, at the end had financial difficulties and just needed to liquidate. And if the next person trades at 400,000, that marks everything down again. So you can have with these stock kind of assets, you can have a situation where even if you have a supply shortage, the marginal seller, because there's a small number of people who are desperate to sell, they end up marking the whole stock down. Hmm. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Next up, we have Zora Lina from, from Canada, where I'm from, uh, who said, good morning. Thank you for this amazing lecture. Mahmoud, how high do you think the euro can possibly go in the current environment? So the like many currencies, one of the, the big determinants of the euro, and let's talk about the euro against the dollar, mm -hmm. is the interest rate differential. And so if I put my money on deposit in the US around 5%, if I put it in Europe, it's whatever, 4%. And so what's going to drive this is really the market's view on where European rates are going to go relative mm -hmm. to US rates. That's one factor. The other factor is relative inflation rates. Right. And so higher inflation actually hurts the currency because it means in real terms, your yield is low. Um, and so relative inflation rates and relative interest rates uh, are really going to determine that question. Um, my personal view is that the market in, in the US is a little bit too optimistic on how quickly the Fed can bring rates down because there's evidence to suggest inflation is going to be stickier and harder to squeeze out of the system than, than we, the consensus thinks. And so therefore, the dollar may well benefit relative to the euro in the next three months. Okay. So be wary of that. Cool. Thank you. Uh, follow up here from Ginny from Vietnam. Can you please explain in simple terms how George Soros broke the Bank of England and the Thai bot and why more hedge funds don't do that? Yeah, so very specific circumstance there. And before the euro, you had a fixed exchange rate system where all the individual currencies were fixed to each other in certain bands. And so you had this um, situation where it was three pounds to the Deutschmark, for example. And it had a band, it could be 3.1 or 2.9. And what would happen if everyone started selling the pound, the Bank of England would come along and start buying pounds and selling Deutschmarks. Um, and if everyone was buying the pound, they would, they would do the opposite. They would defend their currency. And one of the ways they defend the currency is also increasing the interest rate. So what happened was that everyone started selling pounds and buying Deutschmarks. The pound was under pressure. And so the Bank of England started raising rates. And George Soros took the bet that the rate rises were so painful. And I think they raised them by like 2% in a day or something. Just it was an emergency lot, yeah. to support the value of the pound. George Soros took mm -hmm. the bet and they called the Bank of England's bluff and basically said, I don't believe you can keep rates up here because you'll destroy the economy. So I'm just going to double up mm -hmm. on selling even more pounds because you are going to cave mm -hmm. and he was right and they did and the, the, they they broke the band and the pound depreciated and he made a fortune i'm not familiar with what happened with Thai bar but yeah. this this happens a lot with fixed exchange rates yeah yeah so i think he made a, a billion dollars in one day by forcing the bank of england to, to float uh the pound can hedge funds get together and force other currencies uh to go off a pegged uh, 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 fixed rate to the US dollar? Like what would stop hedge funds from trying to short, say the Dominican peso, which is pegged to the US dollar? So there are, and these increasingly apply to all asset classes, market abuse rules, and there are laws against collusion. Mm. So FX was very much a world on its own 
but it certainly is now much more under the view of regulators. And certainly uh, collusion by hedge funds, depending on the particular regulatory regime, may be uh, illegal. The, the broader point is that, you know, the famous Hunt brothers cornering the silver market, the, the point with illiquid currencies is that if they got together and managed to devalue the Dominican peso, the big problem is when they buy their position back, in an illiquid market, they basically give all their gains away. Hmm. They, Interesting. They're selling on the way down and then they're buying on the way up. So if you look at the average entry price of the short and then the average entry price of the cover, hmm. it's not that straightforward that you can make a lot of money out of it. And then, you know, you've always got this sort of game theoretic issue of are all these co players colluding going to stick to the rules? Will one of the X number of hedge funds uh, decide to buy back before everyone's agreed to buy back. It's 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 really a pretty tough trick to pull off. Okay, cool. Thank you. Right. Awesome. All right. Uh, next up, the Berlin is asking Mahmoud, what do you think about the Mexican economy? So I'm not too familiar with what's going on in the Mexican economy right now. I'll be totally honest. Mm. The longer term view, certainly from from a few years back, is number one, it is very tied to the US economy. Hmm. Number two, it's got an interesting feature like Philippine economy where there's a lot of money that gets repatriated. Hmm. So there's a constant flow of dollars being sold and Mexican pesos being bought by Mexicans in the US sending money back home. So this, hmm. the currency has a continual kind of flow of support. Number three, it is it has generally been and again, I might be a couple of years out of date, a, a bit of a darling of the um, global investor community, huge amounts of car production, a lot of promise. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where we are right now on the outlook, to be honest. Okay, cool. All right, next up, we have Eric from Florida who's asking, uh, what is your opinion on the situation in South America? Again, you know, if we look at... Um, the biggest economies, for example, Brazil, uh, and this plays to a wider theme uh, that's particularly in fashion this year, and I think it's going to last, and, and that is that emerging market economies and stock markets have done quite well. And while the US and the Eurozone struggle with the challenges of inflation, having to hike interest rates and slow the economies down, um, emerging markets have growing middle classes. Brazil is certainly one of them. Uh, and so certainly for this year, and I think for the longer term, one really needs to look quite closely at South American economies, India, China, Southeast Asian economies, Indonesia, certain parts of Africa as well, um, and have some small exposure to those growth stories. Great. Speaking of Africa, Rose from Virginia wrote, Mahmoud, do you see any African economies growing at a substantial level that they could become prominent on the world stage within a decade? So you'd have to pick Nigeria as one of those. And one of the things that's really interesting is the adoption that many African sub-Saharan economies have um, in terms of technology. Uh, quite advanced in terms of mobile banking and mobile payments. They sort of skipped a whole a generation of investing in fixed telecommunication systems. They went straight to mobile. Um, and so I, I do think, and the other thing about Africa demographically is they have the youngest demographic, from a demographic perspective, the youngest population uh, on planet Earth as a continent. Uh, and that means the sort of number of working age uh, people on the African subcontinent is pretty enormous and will stay quite high while, you know, other populations age. So I think Africa as a region is definitely worth looking at. And certainly the, the big one like Nigeria has a huge amount of potential. And there are others too, like Ghana, um, Kenya as well. Cool. Thank you. Question from Caroline. Mahmoud, is investing in real estate safer than the stock market in the current environment? So... Uh, there's a huge appeal that, you know, real estate has huge appeal because not only is it, a, is it an asset that can give you a return if you rent it out, um, but, you know, it, it, it is a, a physical asset. It's always going to be there. 
um, and housing is something that we're always going to need. So from that perspective, it has a lot going for it. I think the thing to be careful about is trying to somewhat get your timing right uh, and being very careful not to over leverage. There's so many stories of, of people who have strings of properties that are all leveraged and then prices go down a small amount and they, they will sort of evaporate in a puff of smoke and a fire sale. So I think caution is the word um, when it comes to real estate investing and a very long term focus. And if you're going to have a long term focus, it means you have to be able to hold on to it. Okay, great. Thank you. Next up, the Berlin asked, uh, somebody asked Janet Yellen about Social Security going out in nine years. How can somebody protect themselves for retirement? Well, I think that thinking carefully and applying best practice as you build your portfolio um, is undoubtedly something one has to do. If you are looking for income, then you want to focus perhaps a bit more on higher yielding assets. And of course, the number one objective in building a portfolio is diversification. If there's one so-called free lunch in investing, it is that diversify across companies, diversify across sectors, and think a little bit more about dividend yield paying stocks than about growth stocks if you want to replace an income stream. Makes sense. Thank you. Eric is asking, uh, Moody's downgraded the U.S. debt years ago. Do you see further uh, downgrades uh, of U.S. debt? You know, on balance, I think it is possible. And I think it's a real risk as mm. U.S. debt as a percentage of GDP has now, I believe, headed above 100%. Um, and so, yes, I, I think it is, it is all, you know, was unthinkable a few decades ago, but we're now in a more fragile world and the U.S. is, is also more fragile from a fiscal perspective. Hmm. Great. Excellent. Mahmoud, I want to thank you for your time. This has been incredibly informative. I've, I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Most welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Chris. All right. God bless you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. That, w that was fun. And if you guys want me to do more uh, interviews like that, uh, please let me know uh, as well. I think the answer is probably going to be yes. Yeah. That was incredible. I learned a lot. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to your questions uh, that you have for me. Um, and then if we have time, maybe in about a half hour or so, I'll open up Zoom and you can all ask me questions uh, over Zoom as well. All right. So let me kick it off here with, give me one second. Uh, Abel wrote, good morning, Chris. Good morning. I hope you and your family are doing well. Likewise. Can you please explain what CDs uh, in the bank are and do you suggest putting your money in CDs? Yeah, so CDs stand for Certificate of Deposits. Um, so when you when you put your money in the bank, there is a, a checking account with a pretty low interest rate. Then there's a savings account with a slightly higher interest rate usually. And then you've got something called a CD, Certificate of Deposit, with a higher interest rate usually than savings accounts. But what you have to do is you have to lock up your money for usually six months at least. Uh, and that's why the interest rate is slightly higher. And yes, I do recommend having that in your portfolio. Uh, I don't recommend having, <clears throat> pardon me, more than $250,000 at any bank in the United States, uh, just given FDIC uh, insurance. Okay. All right. Um, next up, let me skip over a couple of questions here I asked already. Okay. Okay, next up, Chitan is asking, what is meant by VAR and how do I gauge a portfolio with VAR? Yeah, so VAR, it, it stands for value at risk and it's a mathematical calculation uh, you can use to determine uh, what the minimum amount of loss you're going to have is based on independent variables. Yeah. Uh, next question is, what is a proxy statement? A proxy statement is, is used uh, by publicly traded companies uh, for votes, shareholder voting. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, next question is, uh, does the uh, Haroon Education Ventures MBA teach game theory uh, and what is it? We, we do go over that. I try to stay away from theory. You'll never see me explain supply and demand curves because most people don't use that uh, in the real world unless you're an amazing economist like, like Mahmoud. But game theory, it, it's kind of like chess uh, where you're thinking one or two moves ahead of what your competition is going to do. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to... Uh, Andre wrote, uh, what should investors look for when investing in bank stocks? Yeah, great question. So bank stocks tend to do well when interest rates increase a bit, but when interest rates increase too much, they don't do that well. So there's a fine line. 
But the bottom line is you definitely want to look at return on equity to be at least 10% uh, when it comes to investing in banks. Yeah. And debt covenants too, uh, obviously. Okay. Ayush wrote, good morning. Love from India. Love right, right back to you as well. Okay. We got Renbeer from uh, Mauritius who wrote, uh, hey, Chris, hope you're doing well. Likewise, my boss told me to prepare a stock trading slash investing course for the company. To give you an idea, the course should be a little bit like Robin Hood Learn. Um, how do you think I can proceed uh, to make uh, this course? Yeah. So um, I'd, I'd be happy to teach you how to how to teach online on, on great websites like Udemy uh, if you want. I know you're in my Silver MBA program. Today at 10 a.m., we have a one-hour Zoom call, uh, and I'll help you get up and running. Okay, uh, next up, um, let's see here. Abel wrote, do you have any advice about 401k? Please explain it in more detail. Yeah, ab absolutely. So a 401k is, is a retirement savings account uh, in the United States. And the most you can put into it is $22,500. And, uh, and basically what it means is when you invest that amount every year, you don't pay taxes on it until you take that money out many years from now. Uh, and I... Humbly recommend everybody max out their 401k if you can. And if your company matches you dollar for dollar, for example, with your 401k, please max that out as well because that is free money. Now, I get a lot of questions about a Roth IRA, which is a little bit different. A Roth IRA means uh, you pay taxes first, then you put the money in the Roth IRA, about six grand per year, and then you let it grow and you never pay taxes on that again. And it's controversial, but Peter Thiel uh, actually put a lot of shares of PayPal uh, and also uh, Palantir. And I think maybe Facebook uh, in his Roth IRA, $6,000 worth. Um, and then that that amount now is worth, uh, I think, between 5 and $10 billion. Yeah. So if you think that you're going to be paying much higher taxes in the future, uh, then I would recommend looking at, at a Roth IRA. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nidin, good morning. Good, good to see you. Uh, Manas from India wrote, good morning, my, my dear mentor, Chris, please. Uh, and Mahmood, uh, what a wonderful day. Hope you're, you're doing well. Uh, and I love these calls. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, and I'm skipping over non-economics questions you guys have for me. And what I'm going to do actually is if you guys want to join Zoom right now, uh, we, we can do so. Okay. So the way to join uh, Zoom is you go to, I'll show you, Go to um, harunmba.com slash zoom, all lowercase. Again, that's harunmba.com slash uh, zoom. And I think I might have spelt that wrong. Let me try it again. Hold on a second. Haroon Ventures slash zoom. Let's try this. There we go. Yeah, go to harunventures.com slash zoom and click on this link right here. Uh, and then you can join the, the Zoom call and, and ask me questions that way. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Michael, Michael Jordan, uh, who's uh, one of my first MBA students ever, actually. He's from Trinidad. Uh, and hello to your wonderful wife, wife uh, Rosemary, as well. Uh, wrote, in certain parts of finance, some companies and firms do not use mark-to-market -market accounting practices on certain assets. Why is this uh, an acceptable uh, practice? Yeah. So it, what some firms do, and I know a lot of uh, hedge funds do this that invest in venture capital firms, is they value certain assets they have at a higher level when they're not having a good month performance wise. So they can actually mark up the value of a certain private investment they have uh, when they're not having a very good month. I, I think that's borderline uh, illegal or unethical, uh, but that's why a lot of people do it. But mark-to-mark -mark accounting basically means you value all assets and all investments at the going price right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and then uh, Eduardo from Texas, who goes by Electronics Onsite, and congratulations on your son uh, being the uh, Taekwondo champion for 16 years and under. He wrote, uh, what are your thoughts on banks going out of business, such as Silicon Valley? Are credit unions safer places? Should people pull their money out of banks? Yeah. So my thought process on that is, I, I think I prefer personally to keep my money um, in, in larger banks. Okay, so I know there's FDIC insurance, uh, $250,000 limit uh, per bank, 
But from a corporate perspective, if you have a lot more than that, um, I recommend looking at larger banks that are deemed too big to fail. Yeah. Okay. And I know that Mahmoud's opinion uh, differs a, a little bit on that, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Arjun, who wrote, Good morning, Chris. I hope you and your family are doing well. Likewise. I want to ask your recommendation on best practices to purchase a domain and how to get an official company email address. Yeah. So I, I usually go to um, uh, godaddy.com or register.com uh, to purchase the domain. What you can do is you can go to whois.com as well to see if that domain name is taken. Now, before registering that domain name, what I recommend you do is you do a search on um, a, a, a trademark search to see if somebody already owns that brand. And, and the way to do that is you can go to the U.S. Uh, 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 Patent and Trademark Office website, which I'll go to with you right now. So you go here to USPTO.gov, and you can do a search to see uh, if, if a trademark uh, exists. Okay, so you search here for, for trademarks. So, for example, um, you can search for Haroon to see if that exists. Uh, which which it does. I have a, a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, uh, these brand names here uh, trademarked. Then you want to hire a lawyer, and you can always go to LegalZoom.com to hire a lawyer. I'm not affiliated by anybody. I don't get kickbacks from anybody ever, but I do be, believe that LegalZoom.com is the best place to hire a lawyer because it's quite cheap. And you want to make sure that you can register legally the trademark for your brand name. Then go ahead and get the uh, the URL. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anurag wrote, uh, what is the future of the uh, Indian uh, economy? Well, we heard earlier today that Mahmood said uh, that he thinks that the Indian economy will pass the United States economy in terms of GDP within 25 years. Uh, I agree with him that the investing prospects for India are outstanding. He mentioned to invest in the Nifty 50 uh, ETF, uh, which I believe in as well. Yeah, so I'm I'm very bullish on India. You know, it's the world's largest democracy. Um, you know, it's doing a lot more business now with, with China. Uh, the amount of trade it's done with China in the past years increased 400. Uh, percent I'm bullish on India in the very very long run. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Next up, uh, Manas said, uh, "What is your prediction about the economy in 24 months?" Uh, what happens to who and why? Yes, yeah, so the economy is slowing. As Mahmoud mentioned, uh, GDP growth in the United States is only 0.5% right now. Um, I, I think there's a good chance we could enter a recession uh, towards the end of this year. Um, so, yeah, I am, I am quite worried about, about the economy at this point. What does that mean for stocks? Um, I don't really care about the, about the economy when I invest in stocks because I'm very, very long-term focused. I don't know the path, but I know the destination on the stocks humbly, that I do a lot of equity research on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, have you tried chat DPT4? I have. It's unbelievable. Uh, and actually, I'm making a course right now uh, that's going to come out on Udemy later this year. I'm partnering with a guy named uh, Luca uh, Anison, uh, and we're creating what's called uh, the Complete Artificial Intelligence and Chat GPT course. Uh, and what we'll be doing is we'll be explaining how to use artificial intelligence and chat GPT in all sectors of business to take your business to the next level. Yeah. And it's going to be techie as well. And as many of you know, I've, I've been going deep, deep, deep into technology uh, courses now as well, which is my, my background. I used to be a programmer. Okay. Um, Uh, and then you wrote uh, that you published a course on Udemy called Chat GPT Mastery. Congratulations, Manas. Nicely done. Uh, then you wrote, thank you for the idea as well. Uh, it was fun to create it, uh, and I'll give it for free to Project Magoo students. Thank you. Project Magoo is, is my the, the charity I work with uh, to take the profits from what I do to build schools in Africa. Uh, and you can always go to projectmagoo.org to learn more. Uh, and this July, I'm actually going to be doing this weekly webcast, the first week of July. Uh, from the school we built uh, in, in Rwanda. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, and let me just go over here see if anybody is waiting to get on Zoom. Hold on a second here. I'll show you what's going on behind the scenes. All right, let's go over here to Zoom. I think Zoom is starting or is it not? Okay, give me a second, guys. Sorry. I'm having a senior moment here. 
I'm going to quit Zoom and restart it. Okay, so I'll go here to Zoom, right here, allow, and I'll launch it in case you guys want to join. There we go. And while it's while we're waiting for people to join, what I'll do is I'll take more questions uh, over here as well. And thank you for your patience. Okay. Question is from uh, Boysenberry, uh, who wrote, how does high inflation affect the foreign exchange market? Is it better or worse or the same to invest in it now? Yeah, so it all depends. So if a country has very high inflation, what they do is they raise interest rates a lot. And when countries raise interest rates, what happens is the value of their currency goes up a lot. So from a Forex trading perspective, uh, if you're investing in, uh, in foreign currencies where interest rates are rising, those will go up more relative to other ones. But I, I humbly advise against trading. Yeah, because it's so hard to, to make money in the short run in equities or the Forex markets because stocks and all asset classes go up and down for geopolitical reasons that are completely outside of our control. Yeah, and you get fooled by randomness too. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we, we have Pearl. Hey, Pearl, how are you? Uh, Pearl wrote, hi, Chris. Thank you for bringing Mahmood uh, on this call. Uh, I read from your bio. Oh, and this is for Mahmood. He worked with Citigroup. Uh, and then you wrote, I recently applied for a position of senior finance uh, analyst. Uh, and then you wrote, uh, any advice? Yeah. Uh, and, and what you can do, Pearl, if you want, is at 10 a.m. today, I have a, I have that that webcast um, for the, the program you're a member of. Uh, and what you can do, and I'm not trying to pitch that program at all, but join that webcast uh, and I'll go through your, your LinkedIn profile uh, in a lot of detail. Okay. All right. Um, all right, next up, uh, Eric, Eric wrote, it's easy for governments to give cash to stabilize things. How should a government ensure that receivers of funds have a, a good uh, business plan? Yeah. Um, so, it, it, you know, failing to plan is plan to fail. I always recommend having a thorough business plan written, which, which I teach a lot in, in my courses, which I'm not here to promote today. Um, but I would focus mainly on a financial statement section uh, of your business plan and forecast three to five years, your income statement uh, especially. And in the first couple of years, you're probably going to be at a loss. And whatever that loss amount is for the first couple of years, that is the use of proceeds uh, that you should articulate to whatever firm or bank or government institution it is uh, that you're trying to borrow money from. Okay. Okay. Um... And Christina, uh, who's uh, the, the head of the uh, Haroon Education Ventures uh, Alumni Association, she has been for, for years. She's great. I had lunch uh, with Christina and, and her husband, actually, uh, Christian, uh, two days ago. Uh, and she gave, they gave me this. Christian uh, worked at Sony for years. So thank you so much for this. Great video game. I, I love it. And what's in this, you guys are curious, is Thor's, uh, Thor's, Thor's axe or hammer, whatever, whatever you call it. Uh, Christina wrote, uh, uh, thank you so much. Great webcast, uh, very informative insights and great content. Thank you, Christina. And, and thanks again for lunch. It was, it was great. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. And Ginny is asking, uh, what book should I read to understand more about the balance sheets of central banks and how money is created? Thanks. What I'll do, Ginny, is I'll, I'll actually ask Mahmood for you and I'll email you the response. Yeah. Okay. Okay, question is, how do hedge funds take positions uh, every day? So what hedge funds do is before the market opens every day, uh, they have a morning meeting. And if you want, you can go to my YouTube channel and watch a vlog I just posted uh, based on the television show Billions and how their morning meeting works. And in a morning meeting before the market opens, what happens is the portfolio manager or billionaire hedge fund owner, uh, like Bobby Axelrod, We'll go around the table and ask all portfolio managers and analysts for their best ideas. And based on the ideas they pitch, uh, the hedge fund may or may not decide uh, to invest in those ideas. And I can talk about every sector if you want me to, or every single stock in terms of how analysts would look to invest uh, or, or analyze those stocks. Check out that, that blog if you get a chance. Thanks. Okay. Next question is, are there hedge funds that have only two or three positions? Um, not really, not successful ones. Hedge funds really believe in risk management. If you think of the word hedge, um, so around your backyard, you have a hedge and that protects your house. 
And so a hedge is a euphemism for capital protection. Uh, and so really rich people that invest in hedge funds, their number one focus is capital preservation. Okay. Number two is capital appreciation. And so hedge funds usually have at least 20 positions that are long and short. And, and they're, they're usually, they usually have great risk management or they won't make it in the long run. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from Harsh is, how can I learn about hedge funds uh, trading and their strategy? Are there any classes in your MBA program where I can learn how to invest and trade like hedge funds? Uh, if yes, uh, please tell me uh, which classes. Yeah. So you can always go to uh, my website in the top right hand corner. There's a search box. You can search there for any key term and it'll show you exactly where it appears uh, in my courses. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I do cover that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Ghislaine wrote, uh, amazing learning session, uh, so informative, thank you. And thanks a lot to, to Mahmoud. Uh, ver we're very blessed to have him with us today. He's, he's impressive, it's amazing, yeah. And the way I, I actually had him to come on the call is my, my old boss uh, from Goldman Sachs, uh, Colin Stewart, who is my mentor as well. Uh, he works with Mahmoud now and he introduced us and um, I'm happy he did, yeah. And if you guys want me to have more people uh, on these weekly webcast interview, uh, just let me know, yes or no and who you want to come on have come on this call or what types of people. I've got an incredible network. I haven't tapped it yet, but I think after today's call, I'm going to start doing this uh, uh, more, more often. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Brian wrote, this was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you. Brian is a wealth manager based in DC. Thank you so much for helping couple of my students out with their, their financial issues recently. God bless you for that. Yeah. So Eric wrote uh, uh, more interviews. Uh, Ted wrote, that was great. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I'll definitely get more interviews. Yeah. Arjun wrote, yes. Uh, Anurag wrote, yes, uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, Anurag said, please do bring more of it. I I'm a proud Indian with Mahmood comments on the future of, of India. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's right, man. I think India is probably probably the best economy to invest in, in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, sorry that good, good to see you as, as well. Everybody's saying more interviews, more interviews. Yeah. Okay. And Eduardo, uh, from Texas wrote, hi, Chris, with the fears of the banking and stock sector, is it advisable to have a 401k even with matching without a doubt? Yes. It's free money. You don't pay taxes on it for many years from now until when you retire. And it's really hard to, to call the market. You know, it's the average return on the S&P 500 historically over many decades is 10.5%. So if all you did was you took your 401k portfolio, which is $22,500, and you put it into the S&P at 10.5% return on average, and you did that every year for 20 years, then you'd have over a million dollars. And if your spouse did, you have over two million. Uh, if you did it for your kids as well, uh, in your kids' retirement uh, or educational savings account, a five, um, then what would happen is you would have seven hundred thousand dollars per kid in eighteen years. You can invest fifteen k per year for each kid. Yeah, yeah. It's so hard to time these things. Nobody can time markets. Yeah, that's why we don't know the names of any successful traders. They don't exist. Okay. All right, next up, uh, we've got uh, Craig who wrote, uh, I love this. Uh, you get a chance to see how the two finance pros think and interact with each other. Yeah, well, one finance pro. That's that's my mood, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, uh, and next up, uh, Andre wrote, uh, good morning, how can I buy US bonds uh, in Canada? Uh, what I would do is I would call one of the six big banks uh, that are heavily regulated in Canada and ask them. And if you get to just a, a, a general operator line, when you call them, ask to be transferred to the uh, brokerage department. So with CIBC, it's Wood Gundy, uh, all the banks in Canada have them. And then ask them how you can buy uh, US bonds. And they'll probably recommend that you buy ETFs. Yeah, and I would recommend that as well. Yes, yeah, diversify your risk. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next up, Ake wrote, uh, I'm thinking about using Chinese manufacturing. How can I ship the product to customers uh, who live uh, outside uh, of Canada? Yeah, you can outsource uh, all of that entirely uh, to EMS companies, um, companies like Flextronics, especially if it's a, a tech company 
or or, uh, or Celestica in Canada, which is the biggest thing, contract manufacturing service company uh, in Canada. I would give them a call to see if you can do it. Yeah. You could also do a search on, on Udemy, for example, for drop, drop shipping courses uh, and take those as well. I'm not an expert in drop shipping. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Eduardo wrote, by the way, my son got third place in the nationals for Taekwondo. Nicely done. Congratulations. Very happy for you. Awesome. Okay, and I've got three people trying to get into Zoom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to admit all of you. Uh, and if you guys have a question, uh, raise your hand, uh, and then I'll share the screen uh, with, with the rest of the webcast here. And thank you. Okay. All right. And Camille wrote, awesome podcast. Thank you. And thank you to Mahmood. Um, you wrote, uh, I, I wish that there's more to come. I'll definitely do it. Okay, great. And I've got an amazing network humbly, uh, the who's who uh, in finance, business, etc., uh, I'll start bringing more people on. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then you wrote, what's your feedback for the yellow metal gold? Um, uh, and then you wrote, why is it not breaking the $2,000 psycho psychological level despite a dovish Fed hike uh, and, and dollar weakness? I I'm not sure. It's tough to time these things. Uh, but when the economy rolls over, usually my biggest position in my portfolio is gold. Uh, it was my biggest long position in 2008 when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working. Uh, it definitely is seen as a flight to quality if you're bearish uh, on the equity markets. Um, and so uh, the best way to buy it is you buy ticker GLD. Um, and the reason I recommend uh, buying GLD, the ticker, uh, is because it's an ETF uh, that's very liquid. The fees are 0.5% per year, uh, and you know it's real. If you buy gold uh, from other sources, you don't know if it's real. Yeah. And what some people do, and please don't do this. can't believe I'm mentioning this. What some people do <laughs> is they, they, they buy gold for cash, uh, and then they put it in a safety deposit box. They wait till it goes up, and then they sell it for cash and they don't pay taxes. I don't do that. And if the IRS is watching, I definitely don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, next up, I have got here, um, what type of email do you use uh, for, for social media? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I use uh, register.com uh, for all of my email addresses. It's, it's about 10 bucks a month uh, for all of my email addresses. It works out quite well. Okay, and Ake wrote, um, interesting to know that, that you were a programmer, Chris. Uh, what was your favorite programming uh, language? Yeah, <clears throat> probably probably Visual Basic um, because it's easy and fun to use. Um, I've done C++, uh, Java, which I hated, uh, especially Java. I couldn't stand it um, because it's not that robust. It would always call <clears throat> cause my computer to crash. Oracle now uh, owns a Java through their Sun Micro acquisition, uh, but VB is always the, the most fun. Yeah, and JavaScript as well, and all that. And I'll be teaching about that stuff uh, as well coming out soon. I'm going deep, deep, deep in the technology. Uh, it's my roots, and it's what I'm most passionate about uh, as well. Okay. All right. And I see a, there's a lot of people on, on Zoom. Just raise your hand uh, if you have a question, uh, please. And thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, let's see here. Uh, Manas wrote, thank you for everything, uh, uh, my mentor. God bless you forever and ever, as well as, as your family. I hope Ruby the cat is cool with y'all. Uh, uh, and I've been on 140 of your webcasts. I love them uh, every, every second of them. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Fam family is great. Uh, kids are great. We're actually going uh, next. They're older now. Uh, we're, we're going uh, next week uh, to uh, to Florida. Go to see my, my parents. I love you, mom and dad, if you're watching. Uh, and then we're going to the Bahamas as well. So there will not be a, a webcast next week or any uh, MBA classes. Thank you. Okay. Um, give me one second here. Okay. And a lot of the questions I see here are specific for Mahmood. So I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring on Mahmood again. Uh, if he says yes, I'm sure he will uh, to answer all the many questions you have here that that uh, we haven't that I didn't ask him. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Rose wrote, in terms of guests, I would like to see an executive at a prominent entertainment company like Ticketmaster, Universal, Warner Media, Disney, etc., if possible, on the webcast. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and anybody else, if there are certain people you want me to bring on the webcast, uh, let me know and, and I'll definitely uh, make, make that happen. Okay, cool. 
Again, on, on Zoom, I see there's lots of people in the room here. Just lift your hand up uh, if, if you have a, a question. Yeah. And Brian, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love for you to come live here and, and it's always good to talk to you as, as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Ake wrote, Chris, my message in the chat just disappeared. Uh, I wrote that I'm willing to start a clothing. Yeah. So what happens is um, if anybody asks uh, uh, questions and you provide a hyperlink, I, I can't see them. I can't see them. So i um, so sorry about that. It's something that YouTube does that I don't. And there's certain words that are blocked by YouTube as well. Yeah. Out of my control. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, question is uh, uh, from Ake. Uh, I'm, I'm starting a clothing company uh, with, with my sister in Canada. Uh, I'm using Shopify and I don't know how taxes work for it. Uh, also, I need to register my company name to accept uh, uh, payments. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so w what I recommend is don't ever do your own taxes, please. I'm begging everybody in this call. Um, doing your own taxes is, is like doing surgery on yourself. I know it sounds silly, but I'm trying to make a good point here. <laughs> Uh, because what, what happens is uh, the tax laws change all the time and accountants are always up to speed on this sort of thing. And so you have to get an accountant to do your personal and professional taxes. Now, there's no central repository online to find a good accountant. What you have to do is talk to your, your successful friends, family members, etc., and ask them to recommend their accountant. It's the best investment you'll make, please. Yeah. And very wealthy people, they also have tax lawyers. They pay them like a thousand bucks an hour to make sure they pay less in taxes. That's how the rich stay uber rich, is they pay less in taxes legally. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, let's see here. Manas wrote, is this a fake bull run for, for Bitcoin uh, and, and cryptos? Um, I, I have no idea. Um, I do still own Bitcoin. It's one of the few uh, cryptos I've owned for many years I'm never selling. Uh, but please keep in mind that almost all cryptocurrencies, 95% are absolute scam. Always do your own due diligence. And I always recommend to my students that you should never have more than 5% of your liquid net worth uh, in cryptocurrencies. And please don't ever own more uh, than 0.5% in your portfolio in any one crypto, including Bitcoin. Most of these are an absolute scam. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next up, Mr. Nicholas wrote, where do you suggest to get a, tra a training course uh, in, in private uh, equity? Um, I, I do teach a lot about this uh, in my courses. I don't want to be pitching my, my courses here today, uh, but I, I'm assuming you can also go to websites like uh, Udemy and just do a search on private equity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Mark, uh, uh, who goes by Satones from Detroit, I uh, wrote, uh, my brother from another mother. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, you wrote, I love to talk with you about raising funds from ultra high net worth individuals to buy companies. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the best thing I recommend for anybody that wants to start a company or raise capital is don't raise money ever from banks because banks are chicken. If you miss one payment, they can take everything away. And don't raise money from venture capital firms either because the sales cycle is very long. What you want to do is you want to meet with high net worth investors. You can always do an advanced search on LinkedIn and find people that have one, two, or three things in common with you. Like they went to the same school, they're a member of the same church or organization. And then what you do is you reach out to them and this works. You reach out to them on LinkedIn by sending an in-mail. Okay. Um, now, everybody on this webcast has checked every in-mail you've ever received, but you certainly have not check, uh, uh, checked every email you've received. And so the way it works is you send an in-mail with the following subject line. Hi, they're, they're going to open it. And the contents of the message should be something simplistic because less is more like this. John, hope all is well. I also went to McGill University and I'm also from Mississauga and I live here in the Bay Area. Please let me know if you have time for a quick Zoom call or a coffee. Thanks a lot, your future boss. Thank, sorry, thanks a lot, Chris. That was bad dad humor. Uh, you don't say why you want to meet. There's nothing unethical about that at all. Um, but... They're going to see that you have similarities that they have, and they're going to want to meet with you because you remind them of themselves 20 years ago when they were younger. And during that meeting, once you get the meeting, I want you to bond at first. You always bond before business. And if you're not sure what to bond about, chit chat wise, what you can do is you can just go to their Twitter profile to see who they follow. If they follow certain athletes or sports teams, you know what to talk about. Always bond before business. 
And then about 10 minutes into that meeting, they're going to ask you very politely, why are we meeting? And at that point, you can mention the company that you're starting and, and you'd just love to get some advice uh, and then ask them towards the end of the meeting uh, if they'd like to invest or if they know anybody that also went to the same schools that you went to or the members of the same organizations that might potentially be interested. You have to ask, always ask. Asking you'll receive, it's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. People want to help you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and it's like dating, man. Like if you do enough meetings like that, I promise you, at some point, uh, you will be able to, to raise money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a, a very, very short break uh, right now. Okay, uh, I'll be right back uh, and I'm going to play you a, a very quick uh, a vlog uh, on networking that might answer your questions. Thank you. I don't think you need an education from, from a, a great university to get what you want in life. I think it all comes down to networking. You want more proof? You know, Sir Richard Branson, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. You know, these people didn't have degrees. It all comes down to networking. Relationships are always more important than product knowledge. And, and there's so many success stories of people that started in the mailroom that went on to become CEOs. Now, uh, there's a former uh, CEO of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Another example is David Geffen. Uh, another example is Simon Cowell from American Idol. Another example is Sidney Weinberg, who was once the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Yes, he started in the mailroom. So why is it all these people get from the mailroom to the corner office, almost all of them without degrees, because they know how to network. You know, that the, the mail dude, the mail dude might might stop by your, 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 I don't know, your cube or your office, whatever, in the morning and saying top of the morning to you. Did you see the Blue Jays beat the Yankees again, which always happens, but they're, they're friendly and they're affable uh, and, and they network that way. You know, they, they they're just social. And, and that's why in almost every situation, when, when I used to teach in universities during the evenings, you know, my, my students with the top grades would never get the best jobs or be the most successful. It was the ones that, you know, were kind of social. You know, they went out and partied and they got their stuff done as well. They didn't get the, the best grades, but, you know, getting the best grades does not guarantee success in life. Um, so the bottom line is I, I really think that you can network to get anything you want in life. You don't need a university degree to get a job at Apple anymore. You don't need a university degree to get a job at Google. You don't need a degree anymore. You know, the rules have changed. You want to learn a skill? Learn a skill online. If you want to learn how to code and you're, you're 70 years old and you always wanted to, you're curious, what is this coding stuff? Don't be intimidated, dude. Go to udemy.com, take a course from, from Angela Yu uh, or, or, or Rob Percival. If you want to learn finance and accounting, here I am to humbly help if I possibly can. You don't need a big institution to say that you're credible anymore. Those barriers are gone. They're gone. All you need to do is have a lot of heart and be willing to fail a lot by networking a lot. You know, it's kind of like if I told you that if you were to set up 20 informational meetings with strangers using LinkedIn, using the methodologies I teach you in class, if you were to do that, then I would guarantee you get your dream job. Would you do it? Of course you would. But people don't do it for some reason. I don't know. People are inherently lazy or, or they're just too stubborn to think that the world works a different way. And what would happen with me is, is every year at my, um, when I used to teach during the evenings um, at, at MBA school or undergrad business, um, the first class I would always ask, if I told all of you that if you did 10 informational meetings over the next 10 weeks that you would get your job, your dreams, would you do it? All 70 hands would go up. Then on the last day of class, like 10 weeks later, whatever it is, uh, I would say, okay, how many people did 10 meetings? No hands go up. How many did nine? No hands go up. How many did eight? Maybe one hand goes up. And it's always that person whose hand goes up uh, that did the eight informational meetings that becomes the most successful in life. Um, in, in all aspects of life, actually. All aspects. Uh, because they understood that they have to network and, and ask. And, and they were cool with failure and rejection. And if you're not cool with failure or rejection, you're never going to reach your full potential in life. You know, you only have to be right in business one time. You know, it, it, it's kind of like dating. If I told you, if you asked out 30 supermodels, um, you know, somebody that's incredibly intelligent, attractive, funny, outgoing, you know, caring, all that great stuff. If I told you, if you asked 30 supermodels out in a date and... I, that by the 31st, you would get the spouse of your dreams. Would you do it? 
Of course you would. I mean, you'd say you'd do it, but would you? You got to be comfortable failing 29 times, right? And just think of it this way. The pain of being rejected 29 times is this much. Pain, 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 pain. The pleasure of having that incredible spouse uh, for the rest of your life is this. It's so big, it doesn't even fit on the screen here. Um, so always think of it that way. It's kind of like when I invest in stocks or companies, I always think of risk reward. What's the downside? That's the risk. What's the reward? That's the upside. Reward minus risk is a positive number. Very positive. Therefore, I do the investment. You only have to be right in business one time. So please network aggressively. And again, you can get my networking book from my website, haroonventures.com, which it's free. Uh, it'll, it'll help you to, to figure out how to network to get anything you want in life. Can you hear me? Perfect. Brian, how are you, man? Good. I just got back from Bermuda a few hours ago. Oh, excellent. You had a, you had a good trip? Yes. I took excellent. a lot of the advice from one of your sales classes that I took on Udemy. Oh, thank you. And then thank speaking you. to you personally, right. it worked out really well. Excellent. But they were, they were a few. Um, I wrote notes after sure. completing a bunch of some of the classes you've done. Yeah. On the same course and you could take it for what it's worth sure um, yeah it's your business yeah uh you can address drinking with potential clients yeah yeah and how drink can destroy also um i noticed when i was younger i used to spend excess money to get clients mm -hmm. when i stopped doing that and i just started to make starbucks mm -hmm. i got more clients people treated me a lot different so yeah. i don't know if that's yeah. something you'd like to add but yeah yeah people tend to screw up being too fancy yeah, but I, I re the drinking that took me years yeah, to finally yeah, stop doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I drink during all my webcasts. This is vodka here. Okay, I just want you to know. It, sometimes it's gin, but I'm just gonna. Um, I don't drink anymore, but I don't drink any less. Um, when it comes to drinking, my, my grandfather, God bless me, gave me great advice. Uh, he said, if you go to a corporate event and there's pressure to drink, then just order a, a Seven Up or a Sprite with with lime in it, so it looks like a, a gin and tonic. Um, I don't recommend drinking uh, excessively uh, with, with clients. Um, it's it's kind of a, it's like an old Wall Street thing to go out and party with, with clients. I think people are more dignified now. Uh, plus, it's against the law to spend more than a certain amount of money. I think it's 100 bucks or so. Uh, if you work in finance, as you know, uh, a lot of compliance mandates in big firms. Yeah, so um, I, I don't think drinking is, is really a necessity uh, anymore. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, spending excess money on clients. You don't have to do that. You know, I, I think just grabbing a coffee like you've done is is, is money. You just, and you just bond. Most important thing is just to, as I showed in that networking video, just bond before business, always. You know, a big rookie mistake, uh, which I used to make all the time in business, is you show up to a meeting and you start talking business right away. That's not how the world works. You know, relationships are more yes. important than product knowledge. You always want to bond about, about things. Yeah, kind of like with, with you, the first time I saw you in this webcast, you had Spider-Man number one <laughs> on on the wall, yes. uh, uh, graded by the graded by CGC, I think. And so we, we bonded uh, based on comics uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. Always bonded. I did do that. So this time in Bermuda, I had about twenty three meetings, mm -hmm. and not one of them did I talk about their accounts. I said we're here right. to get to know each other. Let's Excellent. talk about anything else. But uh, yes. I could do that on the phone if you just want to know what your account is. Yes. For. Totally. And, and the reception was so huge. It was so much better. I got to know them. The next thing I know, they're inviting me to dinners and yeah. they want me to come to their house. Yeah. So it was a successful trip just by not talking business. It's it's money. I love it. And no, no, I, I mean, please, I, I learned that from Reed Hoffman, who's the brilliant co founder of LinkedIn. And everybody should read a book called The Startup of You by Reed Hoffman. Um, now, and what he talks about in that book is you set up a, a, a savings account and the money in that savings account should be used for travel meaning traveling to meet with, with clients one-on-one. -on -one. And so I used to do that, you know, back when I was, I was a kid in my, my 20s, I used to fly down to New York from Toronto and have, you know, five or six meetings in a given day with people that work at Wall Street firms, uh, which really helped me get my, my, my first job on Wall Street eventually at, at Goldman Sachs. Yeah. So it, it's always a great investment uh, to, to network. Yeah. It's easier too, man, because you can just be yourself, eh? Uh, instead of trying to be somebody yeah. else. Yeah. No, we just talked about comics and all sorts of stuff. So, oh, I love it. I love more it. enjoyable than the ocean because the ocean is beautiful in Bermuda. So yeah, that's we awesome. Sat and awesome. Comics, so. We're going to Atlantis uh, next week. We're going to the Bahamas. We're going to Florida and then the Bahamas. 
Uh, so I, I can't wait for that. Should, should be, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. That's where all the spring spring break kids are at right now. Yeah. Oh God, it might be crazy. Yeah, my, my kids want to go on all those water slides as, as, as well, especially Dylan. So Dylan is now he's thirteen now, going on thirty. You know, the youngest one. He's eighteen. He's seventeen. So it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be forced family fun. Yeah. Yeah, should be should be great. So, Brian, what, what you got? What do you got going on behind you there? Uh, is that Bloomberg or, or what kind of uh, monitors do you have? Actually, I switched out of Bloomberg. I used to okay. use Bloomberg. Um, yeah, I know that was crazy, but I went to TD Ameritrade with their oh, I love it. Platform. I use that all the time. I it's love it. Yeah, much better than Bloomberg. Totally. I can get totally. the information faster. So this is all Thinkorswim. Excellent. So this whole thing is Thinkorswim. Very good. And cool. I now run all business through Thinkorswim. I love it. I love it. And for anybody out there that wants to practice uh, investing, uh, you can download Thinkorswim and have a paper portfolio to trade options, stocks, etc. It works in Canada and the United States. If it doesn't work for people in different countries, just download the Express VPN app to make it look like you're coming from Canada or the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yes. very well, cool. Charles Schwab is changing that soon. So yeah. But right now you can do that, but we'll see what Charles Schwab's does with it by the end of the year. That's cool. Awesome. Maybe I'll bring on Chuck uh, on one of these calls. Yeah. Um, I, I that would be with, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I met with him at, at a party not too long ago down here in Atherton. Yeah. I met with him and it, it was 20 of us at, at a house. Uh, Reed Hastings uh, from uh, Netflix was presenting on the future of ed tech. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start bringing on guests from now on because the reception today was incredibly positive. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, he was brilliant. He was extremely smart. He knew what he yeah. was talking about. Yeah. I mean, and he did it perfectly. He was calm and slow. Yeah. I thought he was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm very much against using Bloomberg. Um, I used to pay thousands of dollars every month to my hedge fund for my analysts to have access yeah. to it. You can do all that stuff for free on Yahoo Finance or TD Ameritrade's Think or Swim. I love it. Mark, great to see you here. Uh, Mark is, is from Michigan. Yeah. That's right, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Good to see you. So yes, tell you what, guys, uh, stay here on, on Zoom, please. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up the call, the weekly call. Uh, and then for those of you in that other program of mine, I'm not here to pitch my, my programs today. But if you go to the first lecture, you'll be able to uh, get access uh, to the Zoom call. So stay here, guys. I'm going to go dark for a minute or two to wrap up the webcast. And I'll be right back. Yeah? All right. Thanks. Yeah. Brian, stay there, too. Thanks. See you soon. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this call. Many thanks uh, to Mahmoud. Uh, what a gem. I learned a ton. Uh, and I will see you guys uh, in two weeks. Uh, recall that next week I'm on vacation uh, with my family. So the next webcast, public webcast, will be in two weeks. And as with all of my calls, uh, what I do is I end uh, with a very short uh, interview that I licensed uh, of Steve Jobs um, from the Silicon Valley Historical Association that is life-changing. God bless you. Uh, click like, subscribe, and all that stuff. My marketing folks always want me to ask you that stuff. Uh, and I'll see you guys in two weeks. Thank you. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.